Our state has some incredible problems. My name is Lynn Hinderocker. I'm here to talk about that with you and talk about the trends that have shaped this state and dragged us in one direction or another. We're not really doing what, we're not realizing the dream we had way back in the early 2000s or even around 2008 or nine or 10. My name is Lynn Hinderocker. Welcome to Wild News Nebraska. We're gonna get it on right now. <laughs> Do you know how to have a conversation with other people, community members, your peers, that can actually come together and attract big money to your community. Half a million dollars, a million dollars, maybe more. That's what we're gonna be talking about right here on Wild Biz Nebraska. I'm Lynn Hinderocker, and we're talking about a new technology. We'll call it a research technology. I like to call it a um, decision technology, a consensus technology. It's called Data Burst. Hardly anybody knows about it, but I tell you what, the need for, for this particular research tool that I'll be explaining to you in just a few minutes is so pronounced right now because of the availability of new funds, right? New money is, a, it's a, a, the Unicamera right now in Lincoln, Nebraska, 80 different projects, 80 different projects are trying to get funded uh, to get access to a billion dollars in funding here in Nebraska, and even more, by the way. I, I, I think I'm on the short side there, but. The bottom line is, <clears throat> in order to attract this money, proposals have to be made. Obviously, people have to make passionate speeches with a lot of logic behind them and so on. Uh, North Omaha just recently acquired or was uh, granted, shall we say, over $400 million to uh, transform that neighborhood. They've been waiting for 50 years for that allocation for this particular moment in history, by the way, so we'll see how that goes. But the bottom line is groups of, of, of people, a lot of uh, county officials, we'll talk about them for just a second, county commissioners all across the state. There are many counties, of course, here in the state of Nebraska, and all of those counties are allocated certain funds. There are some strings attached, but really quite broadly uh, defined uh, allocation. So um, these people, they're administrative types, of course, and they're sitting around trying to figure out, other than filling potholes or, or repairing bridges, you know, wh what do we do? What's the responsible thing to do with all this money that's coming from Washington, D.C.? What do we do? And how do we have conversations with, how do we make the decision so that we don't get in the doghouse so that we can kind of bring the, 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 the community together? So the concept is community engagement which is basically another way of saying, let's just invite anybody in the community to come in, sit down for a couple hours, and get their ideas, and tell us what they think we should do. We should do in this county, Hall County, Douglas County, Sarpy County, all the counties, tell us what they think we should do uh, with this money. What would be the most responsible and creative and perhaps long-term visionary thing to do with this money coming from Washington, D.C.? Because it's not gonna come again in our lifetime. Now. If you've ever facilitated a small, you know, um, group conversation about some topic that people are only somewhat familiar with, they don't really know the big picture or the details, but they have their favorite idea or thought or something they want to put on the table, they'd like to hear, uh, make sure that people hear them when they make these suggestions and so on. They want it in the report or the recommendation, what have you. A lot of the people that are at the county level or, or city council members would be another example of people that are going to have to deal with this question and they want to ask the right questions. They want to have a fluid, uh, kind of a, a, you know, a positive conversation with people. And they, they're pretty, pretty um, comfortable doing that. They, they think it's going to go down that way. Uh, I have my doubts about that, frankly. Um, but. They don't really have background of facilitating these kinds of meetings. And uh, so people are going to bring their own agenda. Right? They're gonna, they want to be heard. And they want to make sure that money goes in, their, in the direction of their pet project, whatever it is. So <clears throat> they're, I know what they're thinking. They're wondering, well, what if this backfires on us, right? You know, <laughs> what, if, what if one or two people get in some kind of a cat fight about whether the money should go here or the money should go there and how much and when and all that? And they could end up really <laughs> with uh, mud on their face, shall we say, instead of uh, being thought of as the people that brought us all together to sing Kumbaya and everybody's going to be better after these meetings and so on and, and the city and the county will be better and all of that. That's what they're hoping and I don't blame them. However, 
Um, my suggestion to them, and I think anybody who, uh, who's pragmatic <laughs> in the, these circumstances would say, try to find a way to uh, add some technology, make it real clear, make it real succinct so people don't misunderstand. And you said this, but now we're doing this, <laughs> right? You've seen that kind of meeting before. So <clears throat> the technology I want to mention to you is called Databurst, D-A-T-A-B-U-R-S-T, Databurst. Very interesting, and I'll, I'll call it commonsensical, although uh, it's really a very sophisticated tool. Now, essentially you have small groups, 10, 15, 20, 25 people, and they, they each get a handheld device, all right, with several different buttons, and uh, we'll, we'll tell them what you can do with those buttons shortly, but then we also have a large video screen at the front of the room, and there's a facilitator saying, okay, now uh, we, we've got several ideas that we want to bounce off of you, but now we want to get your thoughts as well, we want to get your input about this or that. So you start at kind of a superficial level, you know, and you start asking kind of very broad, superficial questions like, do you think our community needs a blah, 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 whatever it is. Now you, you use your little handheld device, and again, imagine everybody out there, it's gotta be kind of simple, and in fact it is, and they're gonna push yes or no, et cetera. And <clears throat> you see the response of every individual aggregated graphically on the screen, all right? So right off the bat, there's a new dynamic that's brought into this, so that if my attitude is, well, of course, yes, and then you see that 60% of the people in the room have pushed no, what does, that, what does that do, right? Well, it's very interesting, and it allows us to dig deeper. Um, if you thought that, that it's not a great idea, um, I'm gonna give you two options, either this, blah, 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 or this, blah, 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 blah. Tell me which one of those two would be would be better to try to make it more agreeable, something you'd like to do. And so people push that and push that. Now, now we have two or three generations of answers and people are looking at each other like, I had no idea that you, would, that you were for this. <laughs> so it's really interesting. It pulls people together around ideas and allows us to dig deeper in a shorter period of time into what we really should do. Given that you all said blah, 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 you didn't like this or you didn't like that, um, how about this or this? On a scale of 1 to 10, huh? now we get into it. On a scale of 1 to 10, would you say that this is better than that? On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 would be strongly yes, no would be absolutely not, and of course let us know in between. So everybody's doing that, 1, 3, 5, 8, 10, blah, 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 and you're seeing it all graphically in front of you, so it's fascinating what people think, what they really think when they have to put their thumb on a button and then explain why they believe that. And it leads us to a whole a series of creative, usable, actionable decisions, consensus and decisions. It, it, it's a miraculous, I hate to use that phrase, it sounds so uh, grandiose, but it's a miraculous tool that is available to the people in Nebraska at exactly the right time. If you're an economic developer, a mayor, county commissioner, anybody that's got to make a complex financial decision, you're going to want to think about data burst, data burst, and you can learn a little bit more about it on uh, the following website. I'm going to give it to you real quick. Growth Dynamics, it's spelled D-Y-N-A-M-I-X, growthdynamics.org, and you'll see right there, data burst research, because really, when you ask a question of somebody, and you have a little conversation about it and why they believe that and so on. You're conducting research, right? Curiosity is the key, <laughs> the key quality in leadership. And these people that we're talking about right now need leadership. This is a really key moment as to whether or not they can make a, I call them legacy decision. You know, when, when, you, when you call up the governor and say, we'll take that million dollars and this is what we're going to do with it, I'm going to change the quality of life for all young children, education, downtown. We're going to build that up. We're going to attract people this way. We're going to do upskilling over there. There's going to be workforce development going on over here. We're going to work on uh, health care over here. We're going to work on the aging and the elderly over here and give them 50000 whatever it is, right? Whatever it is, somebody's listening on the other side of the phone. They have to decide whether they're going to send you those checks. It's going to change the lives. It's going to change the lives of people. It's going to change the look the tone and the feel, at least perhaps, of any community. I don't care if it's Alliance, Holdridge, 
Fremont, whatever it is, their lives are gonna change because of the decisions that these officials are gonna be making in the next few weeks and or months. They don't wanna be wrong, you know? They don't wanna be wrong. So data bursts exists, so they don't have to cut corners. They don't have to say, well, I think she said this, but he kind of said no, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, it won't be like that again. It's all about clarity, clarity and certainty. Those two qualities, those two qualities kind of come together in a fairly short period of time. And by the way, spark some very creative discussions among people at the civic uh, level and um, amongst the, uh, the urban renewal enthusiasts and so on. Very, very interesting product available at the right time. So ask yourself right now as we head out of the first portion of Wild Biz Nebraska, and again, I'm Lynn Hinderocker. Thank you so much for watching. You know this money is flowing in to Nebraska and every other state and municipality in the country. You're aware of this. You've heard a little bit about this. Um, it's an incredible, transformative, once-in-a-lifetime experience for uh, many people, economic developers in particular, mayors, uh, legislators who are under great pressure um, to, uh, to allocate monies in, to, to really finance one pet project after another. Some of them, I think, very superficial, very petty, very short-term. Um, I have not heard many that have long-term uh, across the state kind of implications. I, that's what I'm looking for, and that's what I'd like to visit with you about uh, again sometime very soon, right here on this show on Wild Biz Nebraska. All right, so think about data bursts. Go to Wild Biz, um, excuse me, not Wild Biz, growthdynamics.org. Look for data burst research and, uh, and give us a call right there on that website. There's a phone number there and tell us what you think about this thing so that it's not a controversial piece of technology. It's, and by the way, it's got to be simple. I want to emphasize to you that anybody can learn how to use the handheld device. It's a very important consideration, of course. We don't want to intimidate anybody or make them feel bad about it. It's not that kind of a thing at all. But the graphics, <laughs> the visualization of people's opinions, it's alchemical is really what it is. This is my final comment about this. It converts, this is a big deal, it transforms qualitative feedback. Opinions, well, I think this and I think that. And it occurred to me that we should do this. You know, those kinds of... Uh, um, biased opinions in many cases, it transforms them into quantitative feedback. <laughs> Precise, specific, tangible, 82% said this with the skew towards that. Really quite incredible. It's the right thing at the right time. All right. Thanks again for watching us here in Wabas, Nebraska. I'm Lynn Hinderocker. This show is brought to you by and uh, coincidentally, and a timely sponsorship, by the way, uh, Newbraska, the Newbraska Network is a one-of-a-kind membership, business-oriented uh, membership, where you can join uh, an organization there and uh, tap into the collective, we'll call it wisdom, for lack of a better word, of consultants and innovation coaches, people that can help you think of a new product, right, or a new service a way to optimize your existing resources, a way to reallocate, a way to rebudget, a way to think about the future of your company. So many companies, you know, 91% of all CEOs believe that business as we know it, business as we know it, is going to fundamentally change in five years. That's a short period of time. That's a massive thing. 60% of all managers are, are thinking about changing their whole management style and their whole management structure, you know, I'm going to do it completely differently. If you're one of those people, if you're thinking even about those kinds of very important uh, considerations as to how you move forward as this pandemic thing lingers but begins to subside a little bit, um, Newbraska is the ideal resource or partnership for you. Again, Newbraska, that's N-E-W-B-R-A-S-K-A, Newbraska.com. Check them out. If you're looking for excitement, a future, a new culture, new products, not just market share growth, you're looking for new market segments altogether, check out this group of consultants and coaches called Nebraska. Well, you know, ladies and gentlemen, right here in Wild Biz Nebraska, we do some very interesting things. We, we cover the entire gamut. We talk about 
By the way, I hope you saw the last show. <laughs> the last show, we're going to come back to some of the themes that were in that, but we talked a little bit about Jojo Siwa, a global pop star who comes from Nebraska and is excited about it, is happy and likes to brag about coming from Nebraska. She's an incredible young lady. I've known her parents for many years, uh, very talented, and she keeps on working, by the way, to, to be more and more talented. She's, she's got her Nickelodeon show. She's got 80 million bows, et cetera. But the key idea I want to mention to you in a business context is range, scope, scale. She's boundaryless. She doesn't think about boundaries. So many business people right now, especially after two years, they feel like they're limited. This is a, a young lady who is unlimited. And I would just want to mention that to you as you do your strategic planning. If you're looking for help, let me know because that idea, you can form, you could have a partner in China by tomorrow, <laughs> you know, seriously. So we, we live in incredible, we live in an incredible age and change is upon us. So do not shirk, shrink back and say, well, we'll just hang in there and be passive and see what happens. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, you need to be thinking about penetrating other industries, related industries, partnerships, technology, getting people moving out, moving broader, doing bigger things. Think about that, please, and we'll get back to that again. But I'm going to talk to you about a personal concept that I think many, many people the last two years, in particular, have struggled with, have struggled with. And, and <clears throat> some things that have happened early in my life, I'm going to share this with you. It's kind of a personal thing, but that's okay. Uh, it's about the meaning of our life, the worth of our life, whether our life has makes sense. So I'm going to just title this informally, Why Your Life Makes Sense. Why your life makes sense. I've already chatted with a few different groups about it, and there's a lot of enthusiasm about this idea. Let me tell you, a lot of people are curious about this topic. They don't want to tell anybody they are, but that's floating around in their brain right now. I promise you that. So, so here's the story. It starts at age three. <laughs> at age three, believe it or not. I was a normal kid. By the way, I started this one day. I said, no, you were never normal, man. <laughs> You've doing, you're never been normal. No, no, no. I was, I was normal. Age three... My mother puts me in the crib, take a nap. Take a nap. I woke up from that nap, ladies and gentlemen, and my eye, my left eye, had completely, <laughs> I don't want to say stopped working, but basically given up. The muscle that controlled the left eye just stopped. Okay? And so the eye flipped to the, to the middle of my head kind of to the top of my, uh, my nose there. It was not a, not a good looking thing. But my, my parents, of course, freaked out and didn't know why in the world this happened to their little boy, right? Now, for the next 10 years, uh, the doctor, the, the eye doctor, had me doing all these exercises to try to strengthen my left eye. And these exercises were unbelievable. Because balance was an issue, right? Uh, when, you're, when your eyes not perfectly aligned and so on, apparently it affects your physical sense of balance. So here's what we did. Now, I grew up in a farm, so we didn't have certain resources that, that maybe town kids had. But one thing, for instance, is that I would have to uh, get, they got mattresses, bed mattresses, like six of them, and put them underneath a big old tree in our front yard. And every day, regardless of weather, by the way, I had to get, I'm just a little boy, Right? had to claw up on those mattresses and jump on the mattresses every single day. I had to jump on top of bed mattresses every day for 10 years <laughs> with, an, you know, with, with the notion of staying balanced and not falling over. Also, my father put up a two by four, very long, I think it was maybe, oh geez, I don't know, must have been 20, 20 yards maybe, something like that. That's a lot of wood. And he put it up on its side, right, the two by four, and staked it in so it was sturdy there in the ground. It was in our front yard, big long piece of wood, and every day I had to walk on the side of that wood huh, to try to once again consciously uh, maintain balance, uh, which was offset by this, this situation with my eye. I also every day would lay down on the floor in my house. My mother would take this ball, red ball, it had a little target on the bottom of it, and, and uh, put it right on top of me right here, and then she'd uh, of course, hook it up to the ceiling right above me, about eight foot above me. 
and then swing this, <laughs> swing this ball, right? And my job was to watch the ball, of course, go, go this way and that way. It was really quite an unusual <laughs> thing for a, a kid to go through for 10 years. My mother was a driver, man. She didn't let up. I had to do it every day. Well, it didn't seem to work. And by the way, I went to school with patches of black tape on my on my glasses. You can imagine how well that went over uh, when I went out on the football field or other, uh, you know, things that I would do in recess and so on. So I got, uh, I got razzed and even beat up a few times because of my glasses, right, and the way I had to, uh, to wear those glasses. So I'm sure it impacted the psychology of my personality a little bit. But nevertheless, I get to age 13, 10 years now of this. None of it worked, none of it helped, right? So we're going to have an operation. My parents said they got it all lined up in a very good uh, high-end clinic there over in Iowa. And I was okay with that, you know. So we went in there and they gave, did the operation. Of course, take the eye out of, of my eye socket and out of my cranium a little bit. And they moved it physically one to a different direction. and You know, kind of um, locked it in, shall we say. And they, they, they got it back in there. And they used a special kind of suture that was very very popular at that time, which was called cat gut suture. I know that sounds horrible. It was very common, though, at that time because the intestines of a cat, don't ask me why, metabolize into a human being's body. So you don't have to take them out like you normally would with a suture. Right? So the eye was inside. The surgery looked it was fine. Everything seemed okay. But at that time, we learned that I was allergic <laughs> to cat gut suture. And my eyes were already sewed back in, right? They're back in my head. <laughs> so this is a very odd thing because uh, it began to heal immediately, of course. And so my brain, not, my, not just my eye, because uh, the neurons and all the tentacles and everything go deep into your visual cortex in the middle of your brain. So my entire brain itched. I know that sounds totally ridiculous, and incredible, but I must tell you that it was such a torturous feeling that I was re I literally attempted to grab my eye and pull it out of my head. I, I know that sounds absurd, but the, the, the itching was prolonged without relief. And at that age, I thought to myself, this is going to go on forever. They had to put metal shields all over my face and strap me down, and they didn't know how long this was going to go on. It was an incredible uh, experience uh, with pain. Uh, the itching was just uh, amazing. And so I had this for two weeks. I had this affliction for two weeks. And uh, I was a very sad boy, you know, very sad. I, I, I assumed this was going to go on forever and I was going to live this horrible life, right? But after two weeks, <laughs> it went away. The itching went away, obviously the healing took place internally, and the itching, the itching sensation was over. Now at that point, <laughs> I was a happy camper. I was the happiest young man on the planet, let me tell you. I went from pain to pleasure almost overnight. Now, three years later, three years later, I was invited to go to a camp, a leadership camp, and um, I was asked, along with about 200 other kids, farm kids, to go to their little cabins out in the forest. We had a facilitator. We went into our cabin. I had eight or nine other kids my age. They're about 16, 17-year-old kids. The facilitator said, I want you all to feel comfortable just saying whatever you want to say. You've got an hour and a half here. Whatever comes into your head, just say it. That's just what we're going to do. No judgment, no stop, nothing, nothing, nothing. Just whatever's on your mind, this is your moment. Go ahead and, go ahead and say it. Well, you got a bunch of 16, 17-year-old kids that don't know each other at all. They're all shy. They're all sitting there self-consciously. Nobody said anything but Lynn Hinderocker said something, okay? Okay? Now, you're not going to believe this, but I have to tell you this. At age 16, I was so conflicted. I had so many things I wanted to say about love, hate, marriage, food, education, religion, sex, da, da, da. It was all, it was on politics, whatever, right? I was so furious deep down inside, and I spoke without stopping, without pausing for 90 minutes, 90 minutes. <laughs> Said things that nobody would 
had thought I would have said at that age, but I did. And when the whole thing was all over, <clears throat> we were leaving the, the cabin, a young lady pulled me aside and said, I'd like to chat with you over here in the forest over here, a little bit by the, by the campfire. She said, she said, your words in there were the words I'd been having in my heart and in my head for quite some time. You said exactly, exactly what I've been thinking. I was stunned. I'm shocked, she says. I, I, I can't believe it. Well, I was, I was, she says, I, I, I love you, right? I have to love you because I, I am you, all right? You are saying what I'm thinking. I was so stunned by this experience that when a few days later my mother came to uh, pick me up in the old blue uh, Pontiac and we drove home, I, I didn't have anything to say, which is very unlikely. I didn't say one thing. I sat in that front seat with my mother. It was completely quiet, dead quiet, and I was roiling inside because at that moment I had a moment at that moment, I knew, ladies and gentlemen, I knew what I was on this planet to do. I have a destiny. I'm fulfilling it right now. But I got to tell you, that's when I knew I'm here to say what other people want to hear, want to say, want to talk about, can't get it together, can't say it. My role is to say it for them, ladies and gentlemen. That's what I do. My name is Lynn Hinder Ruck here in Wild Biz, Nebraska. I know I have, those were the benchmarks. It was a chapter of my life. You have chapters. You have a destiny. You have a purpose. I fortunately discovered what mine was at that time when I was 16 years old, and I'm trying to manifest that right here, right now, on this particular show with you. And I appreciate you dialing us up right now here on Wild Biz Nebraska. I'll see you back soon. Think about what the chapters of your life are about and why your life truly does make sense. Thanks so much. Talk to you next time. Thanks. <laughs>